Right. Like shocking. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it is a little after three, so we, as you know, this is a 30-minute dialogue conversation between Kevin Beggs and Peter Ligori, but I wanted to be here to uh, intro this one because I wanted to say that we really appreciate uh, Peter flying in and uh, sharing his wisdom with us, and as you know, Kevin was um, our past chairman of our board and is now on our board and is the president of Lionsgate, so has a lot of experience, obviously, in, in, in producing and directing and everything else, and he obviously is a good friend of Peter Ligori's. So we're, we're hoping that Kevin still asks uh, Peter some difficult questions, which make him squirm at least a little bit. Um, as you know, um, Lionsgate is um, a big player in the TV world, and, and Kevin is here today to kind of elicit some responses from P Peter that perhaps you haven't heard before. And Peter, we really appreciate you coming down and, and seeing us. As you know, Kevin has recent, uh, uh, Peter has recently been with Discovery and OWN, and hopefully has a lot to say about those experiences. So we appreciate both of you being here. We appreciate you guys coming. And um, Kevin, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks yeah. for having us. Appreciate it. Uh, we, have, we actually have a, a whole bunch prepared, but we're, I'm going to just jump in to the biographical part first, um, which is always interesting to me about how people got started and why. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did you wind up in television in the first place? Uh, well, my, my mother wasn't happy about it, I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> she wanted a lawyer. Um, but uh, you know, my start really was, um, I started in advertising in packaged goods. Uh, working with Procter & Gamble and Unilever. And um, everything I do, even to this day, basically goes through that filter of being a marketer. What does the viewer, what does the consumer want? How do you sell it to them? Can this project be wrapped in, in a package that would be attractive to a viewer? Um, I spent uh, about three years at uh, Saatchi & Saatchi, working with Procter & Gamble. Then two years at Ogilvy & Mather, working with Unilever. And that's when my first big break happened to get into the business. Um, my client at Unilever was none other than Eric Kessler, who is now the president, co-president of HBO. Um, Eric and I would always have Friday meetings. Those Friday meetings would be, we would go to a movie and sneak in our brown bag lunch. Um, Eric went to HBO to, to start a home video division, <clears throat> asked me to join him. Um, what was also funny about that incident was um, I had an interview not just with Eric and his new associates, but with HBO as well. They'd asked me, you know, everyone wants to be in the television business. What, what credentials do you have other than your marketing? And uh, I said, I have two. Um, one is I'm married to an actress, so I clearly know the ups and downs of the business. And two, believe it or not, I had written a script. And uh, as you can tell, it wasn't a good script because I'm here talking as an executive, but it was um, at least was a three-act, well-structured script, and it, it went around um, uh, HBO and uh, got me in, and, and that was really my entree into into the business. That's great. So HBO and then FX. How did FX come about? And uh... yeah, well, um, I was at HBO for pretty much eight years, almost nine years, and. Uh, started in their home video division, which was an outstanding job. I and mean, we were the uh, home of the independents. We would have worked closely with Lionsgate doing output deals. Um, we would buy both the home video rights and pay cable rights to films. Uh, and it was the Wild West for us. It was the nascent stages of the home video business. We almost acted as the uh, bankers to the many defunct independents, the Reichers, the Cinecoms, the Savoys. But our primary independent was Miramax. Mm -hmm. And so I really got a chance to learn the nitty-gritty nitty of, the, of the movie business from Mr. Nitt and Mr. Gritty, Bob and Harvey. Um, and it was, it was a great experience. Those guys really did understand how to dig out and fetter out the, the underexposed and how to market those films and really enjoyed that. Um, but, and then I went over to, the, to be the head of consumer marketing at HBO itself, uh, which was also a great experience. At, at that point, uh, I wanted to get to programming. Because I had certain facility in talking to writers and producers and the programmers, they, they, um, they gave me that job. But I was really not completely satisfied with just uh, being a marketer for the rest of my career. So 
I did a deal with, with Michael, Michael Pukes at the time, where he said, if you want to produce something, you should go ahead and produce it. Maybe we'll buy it. And that should be used as your entree into programming, because I don't want to just take a marketer and put him in the programming group. Um, so I was working with Stanley Tucci on a project uh, which uh, became Big, Big Night, starring uh, Tony Shalhoub and Isabel Rossellini. And it was a labor of love, and it, it, the themes of that movie still continue to this day in both my career and Stanley's career, which is art versus commerce and everyone else's career in this room. Right. Right. The aspirations for creative courage versus the realities of you have to put food on your table. Uh, I really got the, the, the bug I see. producing right. that film. So uh, wanted to move to LA, realized that Los Angeles was my greatest opportunity to uh, actually uh, get near content, produce content, but it wasn't gonna be a straight line. Right. There were two opportunities. One was potentially my being the head of marketing for Disneyland, <laughs> which would have been a weird uh, kind of entree into working within a studio. Right. And the other, in some ways, equally odd entree was starting uh, the Fox Sports Regional Sports Networks, right. all 23 strong at the time. Right. I decided to take that job. I love sports. Uh, it was really three people who started it. It was like Arthur Smith, Jeff Schell, and myself. And mm -hmm. We just stayed in one office, and everyone did everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a lot of fun for first 18 months. I then moved on to be the head of marketing for all of Fox Cable. And at one point, Peter Chernin asked me to take a look at FX. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, what was going on? How did I feel about it? And I, I, I told him, FX at that point was in 28 million homes. Ann Sweeney had been running it. Uh, it was a bunch of daytime programming under the umbrella uh, guise of TV Made Fresh Daily. Mm -hmm. It was a bunch of shows produced out of a studio on 24th Street, all very credible daytime pieces of programming. Some of the shows were really good. Mm -hmm. But then you went into prime time, and they just leveraged the Fox Library and the Green Hornet, Batman, and the whole business model fell apart. So on a Friday, I gave Peter my point of view, and I got a phone call on a Saturday morning. I was on vacation. So Peter Chernin, okay, gets on the phone. He says, oh, good news and bad news. So he said, what do you want first? I said, I'm on vacation. I'll take the good news. He said, you're going to be president of a network. I said, Great. What's the bad news? He says it could be FX, it is in Nowheresville, it's terrible, and I'm probably going to have to fire you. And I, I don't think that kind of quote or impetus appears in any management right. textbook. But for me, it was incredibly freeing because basically what, what Peter was saying is, you can't fall off the floor, so right. go for it. Right. Uh, and we did. Yeah. And it was, I will say, my seven plus years at FX were by far the most uh, rewarding and exhilarating in, in, in my career in this business. That's great. So fast forward from going there to The Shield, which for me and I think for a lot of people was the defining series that put FX on the map in the original space and opened the door for all the other successes that have followed. Well, what, what did it take to get that made and what was the impetus? A lot of naivete it, right. it, it, and a lot of luck. I, I, would, I would love to be able to say that, that we knew The Shield was going to be a hit. Mm. But it was, it was a project that I would say was blessed from the get-go. First, Sean Ryan, who wrote The Shield, had been commissioned by Fox Television Studios to write a half-hour comedy. I think <laughs> they paid him 35 grand to write a half-hour comedy. After a year, he had nothing. He said he wanted to write something that was more of a writing sample. So he wrote The Shield. And the Shield came in amongst 10 other scripts. And I was working with Kevin Riley at the time. Kevin was at Brillstein Gray. I convinced him to come over to FX, which was the most frightening thing he had ever done in his career. But uh, he knew I wanted to create, for lack of a better term, free HBO. Mm -hmm. This whole notion that the broadcast networks and TNT and TBS were all here. HBO was here, and there was this middle ground that wasn't servicing a more intelligent, adult, authentic audience. And with The Shield, 
One of the things we also said we didn't want to do is we didn't want to put on a genre show as our first show. No cop show, no medical show, no legal show. We had to announce to the community, and we define the community as advertisers, affiliates, our audience, and the creative community, mm -hmm. that we wanted to do things differently, that we were going to be creatively ambitious, and we were going to show courage. And Kevin comes walking into my office, and he said, I know you don't want to do a cop show, but this is a different kind of cop show. I think you should take a look at the script. And every page was more electric than the page mm -hmm. before it. So we call up Sean Ryan, and we said, we're going to order your pilot. And Sean Ryan's response was, who is this? Because he didn't think it was me and Kevin. He genuinely did not think it was me and Kevin. And uh, we told him it was us and that we were going to make, make the pilot. And uh, every last aspect of that, again, was, was blessed. We, were, we couldn't find Vic Mackey. Right. And Michael Chiklis, who had just come off the commish, uh, kept trying to get into audition. And we kept saying no. And finally, Michael called me directly and said, uh, Peter, uh, you know, I really want to do this. I do not look like I used to look. I don't act like I used to act. I do not have to audition. I'm a television star, and I want to do it. And so I finally uh, agreed to have Michael come in. And um, I walked past him. I'll never forget, I walked past him in the casting. I said, Where's Michael? I go, that, was, that was him, all ripped and in a black T-shirt, and uh, and he came in and auditioned, and there was no air left in the room. He was absolutely frightening and riveting and compelling, and we just looked around, and someone asked, you know, they looked at me. I said, he didn't win the role; he is the role. And from there, everything just went really well. And the nice thing about and again, it's something that uh, Kevin and his company did with AMC, with Mad Men, and you should always be commended for that. You're doing a terrific job, and television is all the better for you and, and, and Lionsgate you. being in it. But, and please applaud. Thank I mean, you. seriously, it is, uh, it, it is a big service that Kevin continues to have the courage to go out there and do projects that aren't right down the middle of the plate and center cut. But you get one, it opens the door for another. And in fact, the second one in many ways is harder mm -hmm. because you're defined, you've set the bar, and we did Nip Tuck. Mm -hmm. And Nip Tuck was, again, one of those projects that had two reactions. People would say, we should have done a show about plastic surgeons. It was like right there. We all know that there are, there's a million great concepts. Mm -hmm. It's the execution, and Ryan Murphy just with incredible excellence, mm -hmm. uh, wound up writing and producing and directing that show. And uh, that was the one that I think really, the, the, that one-two punch mm -hmm. put FX on the map. We went from 28 million homes to, by the time I left, we were in 70. Wow. Uh, our ratings went from being basically a 0.2 network to al almost a one. And the community really did a great job of embracing us because it's not just smart execs. Mm -hmm. It is it's the community rallying around a notion and knowing good work can be done. And I'm very proud of what we did there, and I think it helped the AMCs Absolutely. of this world and the TMTs and the USAs and everyone here, because uh, that really does show content is king. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours to master something. Uh, you've probably worked those 10,000 hours. but. Yes. Uh, when did you feel, you know, HBO, FX, Fox, Discovery, you've worked at some of the biggest companies in the business. Did, when did you feel like, I got it. I actually know what I'm doing every day. You know, I don't think I have that <laughs> yet. Uh, you know, I've definitely put in the 10,000 hours, but I, I feel that you spend most of that 10,000 hours failing in our business, and it's a, it's a very difficult thing to communicate. I, I, I have... Uh, taught at business school and uh, schools for uh, theater television and, and, and uh, uh, film. And I start out when I, when I teach a TV class and I say, you know, my goal is to basically have 3% of you want to continue in this, in this business. Mm -hmm. And everyone looks at me like I'm nuts. I should be the biggest advocate for getting you into television. And my, my point being that this is a business of failure. You have to really love being in this business mm -hmm. in order to deal with some monumental failures. I and mean, there were shows, 
that I loved at Fox, a show called New Amsterdam, mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I just, I loved this script and I loved the actor and got Lasse Hallstrom to direct it and it looked great and David Manson came on and it's alchemy. You then look at it and realize it's not what we thought it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, this business consistently humbles you. And if you could stand 10, 20, 30,000 hours of failure, you may get those 1,000 hours that are just brilliant and totally exhilarating. And that's the addiction for someone like me. That's great. Thank you for that. The uh, other people talk about the golden age of television, the second golden age of television that we might be living in. Mm -hmm. A, was there a first golden age? Or is this just kind of like happy days? Uh, and now we have Mad Men and we realize it wasn't all what it was mm -hmm. cracked up to be? Uh, and B, if so, are we in a second one? Yeah, I clearly think there was a first golden age of television and I'm happy to be part of what I think is the, the, the second golden age. Uh, you know, the first golden age of television is we, we almost have to take this huge step back. It was a brand new form of storytelling. We had, we had movies, mm -hmm. we had theater, we had some radio shows. Mm -hmm. And the ability to write the I Love Lucy's and the Honeymooners, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Ben Casey's, the Riflemen's of this world, in, in such an unusual format, uh, was truly a golden age. And I, 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 though I don't think TV could have been considered just a, uh, a, a trend, not a trend, but just like a, a quick phenomenon, Mm. Those were great shows, right. and that definitely was a golden age, which which set the pace. And there may have been a golden age with the Norman Lear years as as well. But do I think now we're in one? Absolutely, because storytelling needs to evolve. And and I always use the example of of on its most elemental form, an audience expects something new out of television, out of all their arts, out of all their storytellers. And Charlie Chaplin was the first guy that really noticed this. He, he knew that if he put up on the silent screen, him slipping on a banana peel, the audience would laugh. Did that the first time, uproarious laughter. Did it the second time, the audience didn't laugh as much. And he realized that the audience was getting educated and getting sophisticated, and the, the joke was not as fresh and new or surprising. Third time he filmed him on a banana peel, his foot walked over the banana peel, and he walked into an open manhole cover. And the audience laughed. And what I think that represents is audiences' appetites do get more sophisticated. And we're answering the call right now. We're answering the call by uh, acknowledging and addressing the fact that an audience is more sophisticated today than it was, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. We're able to put in, uh, a Mad Men on and have them appreciate Matt's exploration of sexual mores, frankly, today mm -hmm. by going through the optics of what sexual mores were like in the 60s. And we're able to put aggressive programming on like The Shield. We're uh, able to explore something as surreal as Glee. Mm. Uh, and I, I think, you know, frequently when I talk to students, about writing, I actually say, you know what, I think movies kind of easy, kind of a layup, three acts, mm -hmm. if you got 120 pages, have at it. But if you find a character that you want to write to for 100 episodes, you've got real gold. Mm -hmm. And that's outstanding writing. Mm -hmm. And you see how House has developed, et cetera. Right. Right. You just sit back and go, that's where wonderful writing's occurring right now. Mm -hmm. Got it, let's, let's talk about streaming, streaming video, mm -hmm. Netflix, kind of changed the media landscape, turned the CW into a profitable enterprise after many years of struggle. It's mm -hmm. been a big thing for us with uh, Mad Men. Uh, Epics, it's kind of uh, helped it launch into profitability. Sure. What, you know, what's the long term? Are there competitors? You know, I, first I think there will be lots of competition. I do think Amazon will, will be a player. Obviously Hulu, you read Variety today, mm -hmm. five or so, four, four or so series. Uh, the, the question I think all of us are going to be answering is, you know, Netflix's margins, pretty slender. Mm -hmm. And is this a almost kind of a tech play 
that don't worry about the margins. It's a, it's a long-term term player and, and here to stay. Uh, I think these businesses are gonna have to run as businesses. They're not gonna be able to run like they did in the tech bubble era. So Reed's challenge, especially with those thin margins, is now how to productively buy content. Amazon may have deeper pockets. Microsoft down the road, if they, if they were to develop original programs, they may have different, uh, uh, deeper pockets. Hulu, I don't think will have very, very deep pockets. So everyone's gonna have to be, I think, incredibly smart about that investment. Right now, it's wonderful manna from heaven, all, all newfound dollars. But at the end of the day, quality is going to conquer, not just quantity. Mm -hmm. And those bets are going to have to be, I think, a little more uh, informed. Got it. You've been uh, at places that do a lot of scripted. In the case of Fox, scripted and non-scripted. Mm -hmm. Discovery was more non-scripted. Um, the way the cable landscape lays out, not many are doing both. Mm. Uh, broadcast, yes, but in cable, you know, true falls into reality, not doing scripted. Um, TNT and USA have recently announced that they're going to get into nonfiction. Mm -hmm. FX did it for a while and then kind of got out of it because yeah. the scripted was really hitting. You know, is, is there a, can, these, can this marriage be saved? Can they coexist or do they just need to kind of niche out? No, I, I think they can coexist. I am not a huge believer in rationally branding and programming networks. And what I mean by that is on a, on a rational basis, you know, frequently networks and shows are defined by demographics. You know, we're gonna do women, 25 to 54, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I, I think that the truly successful ones are gonna go that next step deeper mm. and explore psychographically or emotionally mm -hmm. what does that audience want. And then you could program around that. If you have an audience whose emotional thirst is, um, you know, by way of example, uh, you know, a discovery with men wanting to be men. You see a lot of those shows. Mm -hmm. Well, then you can develop right. toward that. Um, you can sit there and say, would a Sons of Anarchy work on a discovery? Uh, you know, quite possibly yes, if you just look at it on that, that emotional level. When you, when you look at it at a true, uh, is there some semi-scripted show, mm -hmm. i.e. the Hills type of show, mm -hmm. and or scripted show, which feeds that audience's emotional need right. to go into dark places and then see resolution? I think the answer is yes. I think it's wrong if you just say, I have females, I'm gonna do a female scripted show. Right. You better feed an emotional need there and then you can be successful. Got it. Comedy has made a big comeback. Mm -hmm. Modern Family kind of leading the way on the broadcast side. A whole bunch of comedy on uh, FX and Fox and all over. Um, what, uh, what do you think informs that? Does it have anything to do with the larger economic kind of you know, anxiety? Everyone talks about the larger economic uh, environment, but the, the reality is um, we didn't get any comedies the first, you know, the first year of it or mm -hmm. our last economic downturn. Mm -hmm. Comedies actually didn't come in and fill, fill the void. I, I, I truly don't think it's a matter of people's state of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's a matter of unscripted filled that comedy void for a long time. If you wanted unpredictability and kids and people right. say the darndest thing and right. truth is stranger than fiction, kind of unscripted just immediately filled that void. Well now, you know, where's unscripted going? Mm -hmm. uh, it's harder and harder to find an unpredictable laugh that doesn't have some uh, relationship with a, a cousin show or brother and sister show. Uh, so now I feel like we're almost substituting possible laughs for comedic guaranteed laughs. You know, writer's room knows when something's going to be funny. The question is whether the audience is going to buy that. So I feel that, that, that comedy is filling a, a specific void. And uh, when you talk about environment, I actually look at a, a, you know, a show, Walking Dead, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and say, you know, because people ask me a lot why I think zombies right. are working right now. And Joe Q. Public faces zombies every day. 
Now, Joe Q. Public wakes up, wonders if he has a job, does he have health insurance, how much is gas, what's going on, mm -hmm. and each day he faces fear and overcomes it, only to wake up the next day and face more. And one of the aspects of brilliant storytelling, brilliant storytellers, is they actually force the audience to exercise their social expertise. So I watch Walking Dead, and I've actually figured out how to go through a very scary but victorious day, and I'm all the better for it. So I feel like that's a show that actually right. feeds mm -hmm. as opposed to a comedy that Got just it. simply makes me forget. Got it. Uh, again, all the places you've ever worked have pretty big international profiles. Mm -hmm. We're here at NAFTA, is a huge international climate. Um, you know, how much is it that big business factor? We talked about the balance between art and commerce in Big Night. Mm -hmm. uh, how much, as a buyer sitting in the chair when something's walking in, do you think about those ancillaries, starting with the international and your studio partners, and how, ca how can they monetize it? Or do you at all, or does that become something down the line after you've figured out the creative? Yeah, well, first, as a buyer, I'm going to be honest, couldn't care less. Right. You know, Kevin, you want to sell me a show and lose money on it, and I can make money? Right. You know, love you like a brother, but right. thank you for the show. Got it. <laughs> as a television person, and being a big proponent of having, because it's really odd, a, a, a lot of television companies, or, or a lot of these studios, their network budget is almost separated from the studio budget. I've never th thought that was a, a proper way of looking at the mm -hmm. business. But if, in fact, you're working hand in hand with your studio, it's enormously important. Mm -hmm. Because you can sit there and say, from a global perspective, let's go tackle this show. And it's mm -hmm. becoming increasingly important. It was very frightening two years ago seeing the plunge in, in international mm -hmm. sales figures. It's frightening to see the amount of local production being done. But again, great content is critical. Right. And so now we do have an eye and should have an eye as a buyer mm -hmm. for what the long-term health of the show is because if in fact you can do those foreign sales, you will wind up with the fringes of this world mm -hmm. staying mm -hmm. on a bit longer right. because of its foreign capabilities. And television is all the better for it because what's, what's gonna fill that void? Probably right. something second tier. Right. Uh, many of us here today are producers, sellers, distributors, aspiring producers. As a buyer, you've sat through many, many pitches. What, what, give us one great tip, if you could say, good pitching always has X, or these are the best. Good pitching always has something incredibly personal at its core. Mm -hmm. And you could almost see it in a writer's eye. Mm -hmm. when they are pitching from an incredibly vulnerable, personal place. Uh, I would say the best pitch to ever to be, have been in a room in was Ryan Murphy pitching Nip Tuck. Ryan had just come off of Popular, mm -hmm. which was not a very successful show. Uh, I think he was incredibly raw from the experience. Mm -hmm. And he came in and discussed really why he wanted to do Nip Tuck. And Nip Tuck's advent was, uh, Ryan was a reporter here in Miami, the Miami Herald, mm -hmm. he was doing a story about uh, men getting plastic surgery. He went in to see a plastic surgeon. They had a great conversation. Ryan is someone who has got his you know, own levels of vanity. Uh, <laughs> sometimes in control, sometimes a little less so. Mm -hmm. And he asked the plastic surgeon, what would you do to me? Right. And the plastic surgeon took out a magic marker and completely redid Ryan's body from head to toe. Oh my God. And it was crushing, right. it was really crushing right. to Ryan. And you knew when he was going to write that show, right. he was going to dig into the psychology of those patients and those doctors, he was going to mine real drama so that pressure's put on those characters so that they would reveal their true selves. Right. And this was a phenomena that was going on that created a specific anxiety that all of us felt. Mm -hmm. Why can't I be better, I can be better looking. Right. And what did that mean for those characters? And that personal touch, you, you know, he did the same thing with Glee. Mm -hmm. 
you felt the, the young teenage Ryan Murphy with right. a yell on his forehead mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. walking through high school in Indiana, and you knew he was going to write something incredibly authentic. Great. Uh, to wrap it up, what, uh, what next for you? Plans? You know, Where do you want to be? It's been two weeks. Who the heck knows? Right, um, right. <laughs> you know, look, uh, I, I, you know, clearly I'm not one of these guys who uh, wants to use the turn of phrase, I'm going to get sand between my toes. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I really don't want to go zip lining in Costa Rica or improve <laughs> my surfing in, in Australia. Uh, look, I think this is an incredibly vital business. And it is, it is as exciting as it's ever been. Uh, I want to take my time. I want to explore the, the possibilities and the ranges of, of everything from uh, big media company, frankly, to, to teaching, mm -hmm. uh, something that I really, really, really enjoyed, mm -hmm. and all places in, in, in between. Uh, I give myself the luxury of not making a de definitive decision, mm -hmm. right. uh, and all I have to say is, no matter what goes on, as long as I am somehow touching feeding content into these companies and into these networks, I think I'll be a happy man. And I think there's many different ways of, of touching that. I don't care if it's uh, an 18-year-old aspiring writer or uh, you know, a 48 four-time Emmy winner. As long as I, I'm somewhere near that great content, I think I'll be fulfilled. Great. Thank you so much. Peter Thank Ligori, you. everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, well Thank you.